everyone, and a warm welcome to those who are visiting with us. I hope that this worship service will renew and refresh your spirit. Would you please note in the prayer wall that we extend the deepest to Christian sympathy to the Hummel family in the passing of Casey Sr. this uh, past Thursday. And uh, the uh, announcement says that Tita is still in the hospital, but she has come home, but is still quite unwell. Please keep her in your prayers. The uh, funeral arrangements have not yet been completed, and they will not be for another two weeks. And would you please note the announcement about Zoom choir meetings on Thursdays, and also the announcement about uh, those who wish to contribute a talent to the worship service, they would be able to make an appointment with Lavinia and Corey for Thursday evenings. And would you please note the uh, biography, short biography of Reverend Dewald Delport, who is our interim moderator, and I believe he's with us this morning. We'll begin our worship service. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord reigns, the nations tremble. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today not to escape the world, not to escape its problems, its suffering, its corrupt politics, and its injustice. We come to be made wise by you. We come to be strengthened by you. We come to be transformed by you. So that when we leave this place of worship, we may engage with the world as wiser, stronger people, people who will be Christ's true disciples in the world. Lord, we cry to you for strength, wisdom, and transformation during this time of worship. Amen. I love 
Yes, we thank Paula Degner very much for uh, singing this morning as Lavinia is uh, sick with the flu. It's the flu only. And uh, so we thank Paula. The prayer of confession, let us pray. God, our creator, we are so easily pulled this way and that way by those who would promise instant healing for all the world's woes. We want all to be whole and happy, and we don't know what to do, so we pay attention to those voices that cry the loudest, whether they are voices of blame or promise. In our fearfulness, we love to place blame for all our woes on the shoulders of a few people. In our anguish, we seek instant answers from sources that are very unreliable. Lord, help us. Turn us around. Help us know that you are our Lord and you have provided much for us. You have given to us abilities and understanding and ways in which we can be those who would bring peace and justice. You have blessed our lives. Help and restore our spirits, Lord. Help us truly place our trust in you and to work in ministries that uplift people. This prayer we offer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In Christ you are forgiven. A reading from the book of Exodus. Hear the word of God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, 
and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will not do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will pro proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. A reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians. Hear the word of God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy and inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Hear the word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to Jesus, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax and they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. The gospel of Christ Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, if I would just remember to say everything at the time of the announcements, it might help, wouldn't it? But another thing that I forgot to say is you may be wondering, uh, I wasn't here last Sunday because I wasn't feeling well. It was just a sinus infection. I had a test and it was negative, so I'm grateful for that. Lavinia has had a test as well and she's also negative, just in case you're concerned about the two of us. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There was a young lady who was uh, trying to soak up the sun's rays on the beach when a little boy in swimming trunks carrying a towel came up to her and asked her, Do you believe in God? Well, she was surprised by the question, but she replied, why, yes, I do. Then he asked her, do you go to church every Sunday? Again, her answer was, yes. And then he asked, do you read your Bible every day and pray? And again, she said, yes. But by now, her curiosity was aroused. And then the little boy heaved a sigh of relief, and he said, will you hold my quarter while I go in swimming? Now, this little boy had an honest question. He wanted to know if he could trust this woman with his money. The Pharisees and the Herodians had a question about money too, but it wasn't an honest one. They asked Jesus if it was in keeping with the Jewish law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not. But they weren't really interested in his answer to the question. What they wanted to do was to discredit him in the eyes of his followers by trapping him in what they believed was a no-win situation. The Jewish nation was a theocracy. That is, they believed that their only king was God. They refused to recognize the Roman emperor as their king. Therefore, if Jesus answered the question by saying that it was lawful to pay taxes to the Roman emperor, it would discredit him in the eyes of the Jews who didn't recognize the Roman emperor as their king. He would probably lose many of his followers. On the other hand, if Jesus said that it was not lawful to pay taxes to the Roman emperor, he could have been arrested by the Roman authorities for spreading sedition against the state. Jesus' questioners thought they had him trapped. No matter how he answered the question, they thought he'd be in trouble. They believed that they would achieve their goal of getting rid of this Jesus whom they hated. Now it's interesting to note who his questioners were, the Pharisees and the Herodians, now, normally, these two groups hated one another, for the Pharisees believed that the Roman emperor was an illegitimate ruler of the Jews, but the Herodians, who were followers of King Herod, the Roman representative in Galilee, supported the paying of the tax to the Roman emperor. And although these two groups hated one another, they both hated Jesus. Politics always makes strange bedfellows, doesn't it? Political groups that hate one another will form a union together against a common enemy. And of course, we see that in politics today very often. Jesus' enemies thought they had him trapped, but he deftly answered in such a way that destroyed their devious plot. He asked them for a coin because apparently his pockets were empty. He then asked them whose head appeared on the coin. And they replied, the emperor's. And then Jesus said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Now with that answer, Jesus' questioners were floored they could do nothing but walk away. For he had outsmarted them by taking neither the side of those who approved of the tax 
nor the side of those who oppose the tax. Now, while we admire Jesus' cleverness, we're left with one question, however. How do we know what belongs to the government or the emperor or the king or the prime minister or the president and what belongs to God? Well, Jesus didn't answer that question. He didn't say to give a certain percentage of our income to the government and another percentage to God. He simply said to give each one what belongs to them. Well, how do we know what belongs to each one? I think Jesus is doing here something that he did in most of his teaching. Instead of laying down a specific rule, he laid down a principle. When you lay down a rule or a regulation, you're being legalistic, of course, and you're telling people exactly what to do, when to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But when you lay down a principle, you give people a truth that they themselves must work out how to apply. For isn't that actually what discipleship is? That's what living a Christian life is. That's what our life's work is. We spend our lives trying to figure out how to apply the truths that Jesus has taught us. That puts a greater responsibility on us than if Jesus had simply laid down a rule. And often Christians prefer rules over principles because rules tell you how to think. But but principles ask us to do the thinking, which of course requires more of us. But it seems to me that that's how Jesus taught. The Bible is not a rule book. The Bible contains truths that we must spend our lives trying to figure out how to apply to the situations in which we find ourselves. If Jesus gave us specific rules, then I don't think we'd actually be disciples. For discipleship is spending our lives trying to understand, to figure out, to perceive how it is that we be followers of Jesus. God created us with a mind and a heart, and he expects us to use both of them to learn how to be his disciples. An elderly woman that I once knew in a congregation, another congregation, once said to me, here I am, 90 years of age, and I'm still trying to figure out what Jesus meant when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. I understand it now better than I did when I was 20, but I still haven't grasped it completely. Now her words are very, very wise a woman who gets it, a woman who understands what Christian discipleship is. For Jesus laid down principles, not rules, and one of his greatest principles was, love your neighbor as yourself. A principle that this woman had spent her whole life trying to understand, trying to figure out, and trying to apply in her daily living. St. Francis of Assisi, my favorite saint, spent his whole life trying to figure out how to be a channel of peace and love in the world. And he wrote a great prayer expressing that challenge. St. Francis understood that love is a principle that has to be applied to our whole lives, a truth that must come into all that we do in our life. But figuring out how to do it is a journey that we spend our whole lives making. What then is the principle that Jesus is giving us in this story about paying taxes? I think Jesus is telling us that we have a double citizenship. We are citizens of our country, in our case Canada, 
and we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We owe our country many things. We owe it protection from lawless people, a protection that only a settled government can give us. We owe our country or our province or whatever it happens to be uh, public services. Few of us are wealthy enough to provide our own electricity or sanitation or water. In a country like Canada, we depend upon some level of government for education, health services, employment insurance, and pensions in our old age. And we must be responsible citizens and pay our taxes, which provide all these services to us. Jesus, I believe, is telling us that our, we must uphold our responsibility to the government, and a failure to do so is a failure in Christian discipleship. We have a duty to the government in return for the services it provides us. The Christian, however, is also a citizen of heaven. There are matters of religion and morality in which we are responsible to God. Now, we could live our whole lives and find that our responsibility to the government and our responsibility to God never clash. But there may come a time in our lives when we become convinced that our responsibility to God must take priority over our responsibility to the government. And where the boundaries of these two responsibilities lie, Jesus doesn't tell us. That is, he believes it's for our own consciences to decide. And when we do decide that we're going to give priority to God over the government, we must do so with the utmost of humility. We must never take the arrogant view that we have the truth and no one else does. We are all travelers on a journey as Christians. We must never take the egotistical attitude that we've arrived on this journey. None of us has arrived. We are all arriving. We are all works in progress. A humble Christian always listens to all points of view and sincerely grapples with all sides of an issue. The truth that Jesus lays down in this story of, about taxes is that all Christians should be good citizens of their country as well as good citizens of the kingdom of heaven. There are no easy answers as to how to do this. And it's not as if you can just start thumbing through the Bible and find some easy answer. That is not what the Bible is meant to be. It's not a, a rule book. It's not a how-to book. It's a book of truths and principles which we must figure out as Christian disciples how to apply. And we spend our whole lives trying to figure out how to live our double citizenship as citizens of our country and citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, that you have created us with minds to think, with hands to do, and with hearts to love. We thank you that you have placed so much trust in us and have made us co-creators with you, charging us to make a world of justice and peace for all. We thank you for the times we have been inspired by your spirit to do your work, to bring love where there was hate, to bring peace where there was turmoil. Holy are your ways, O Lord. We thank you for allowing us to share in that holiness. Gracious God, hear us as we pray for the needs of your people. We pray for our political leaders. Give them the courage to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who suffer from the consequences of others' mistakes. Preserve them from bitterness and show them a new way forward. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who are suffering due to lost income because of this pandemic. Show them a way forward. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who are victims of family violence. Heal their wounds through the loving care of others. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who struggle with addictions. Give them the courage to seek help and the strength to follow the new direction they are given. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who love money more than people. Show them a new way, your way, of divine love. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those so sure they are right and others are wrong. Raise up people to educate them, to help them see all sides to an issue. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those who are weak and discouraged due to illness. Give them hope and courage. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for those this we pray for the people of this congregation and all people of faith. Show us the way to be a beacon of love and peace in the world. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray for all faith leaders. Preserve them from discouragement and cynicism as they struggle to lead your people. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Now hear us as we pray silently the words that Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you today and always. Amen. Please remain seated during the postlude until the ushers come to help you leave the building.